Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So this next um, hour, we're gonna kind of do a behind the scenes for RMG, uh, for those of you interested in developing, but we're also gonna do just a high level tutorial of if you find something wrong with RMG or if you'd like any feature, uh, how can you request it or how can you, um, get the idea out there. Um, so yesterday when I told you everything, or excuse me, one day when I told you that everything you need with RMG is on rmg.mit.edu, secretly lied. Um, a lot of this actually is run off of GitHub. So you'll notice what I just did right there. I clicked on the documentation button and the website looks the same, but we've actually moved to reaction mechanism generator.github.io. And what that is, is a nice, pretty looking wrapper on top of this page, reaction mechanism generator slash RMG dash PY. So this is the actual source code and packaging uh, instructions and documentation source code for everything that you've interacted with today, the Docker, the code in the Docker, all the pages, uh, the RMG website, um, everything is on GitHub. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with GitHub, um, it's a type of version management software. So if you've ever been in one of those really annoying situations where you're trying to like write a paper with someone and you both just have your own separate Word doc and then you send it to each other or like 10 people send it to one person and it's their job to stick it all together, uh, Git is a way to get around that issue. So everyone can have their own separate distributed independent copy. They can make changes to their heart's content. And then Git allows us to uh, combine those changes back together, uh, test them, and uh, distribute it to everyone else. Uh, GitHub is just one particular uh, basically implementation of Git. Uh, they do a lot of nice things like render this pretty UI we're looking at. They provide us um, some free resources that we can use for testing our code uh, and a lot of nice uh, team management stuff so that everyone can get access where appropriate. So if you are scrolling around through the RMG source code, so let's say, for example, that, or actually, if you're looking at the documentation either, so maybe let's look at the RMG installation instructions. Let's say that you're scrolling through this and you find a typo or you find an instruction that's unclear. So this function, for example, actually no longer exists. So this isn't a problem we should have anymore. So th this is what you should do uh, in the case of finding a typo. You get an error that you don't know how to deal with when you're running. You have any, any kind of question. Um, You'll go to GitHub. Um, if you don't have an account already, you'll need to make one in order to do this. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and I think all it takes is like an email. Uh, you'll go to the Issues tab, and then you'll press this New Issue button. Um, you'll notice we have a, a small collection of 388 um, issues already. Um, some of these are like simple reminders for us to deal with later. So some of the constants that we have need to be updated. Um, some of them are a bit more substantial. So like the testing apparatus um, occasionally fails on some operating systems. So you can see here, we, we have reminders for developers. We have uh, questions from users, all that kind of stuff. So you'll click new issue. Um, if it's a bug or a typo or anything like that, you can use bug report. If you want a new facet for uh, RMG cat, or if you want to, uh, request some new feature for adaptive tolerances or time stepping or something, you can do a feature suggestion. If you just want to know how to do some particular system using RMG, you could open a question instead. And then in the actual issue interface, we have a pretty thorough uh, tutorial for how to fill this out so that we can help you as quickly as possible. So I won't read through this right now, um, but I encourage you to do so as you need to raise issues. Um, and again, please fill out as much of this as you possibly can, just so that we can help you out. 
um, without having to start like a 10 message long um, interaction. Hopefully we can get it down in like one or two. Now, for those of you who are interested in developing RMG, which is hopefully a lot of you, we would like lots of contributors. Um, the way that you can make your own changes to RMG is you come up here and press the fork button. So what fork does is you get your own copy of reaction mechanism generator slash RMG pie that's going to show up on your account. So if I click fork. In my case, I already have my own fork, so it won't let me make another one, but we can navigate over to that real quick just to get a look at it. So you can see here, um, I have my own unique copy, and in here I have um, some of the changes that I've been working on um, just on my own time. So this was a branch that I made, which is a subset of the main repository where I was working on uh, making sure that you could do this, that you could run all of the tests on forks and actually get your changes validated and hopefully eventually merge. Um, and now, once you have a fork that is uh, prepared with some changes that you'd like to make, you'll have to go back to the RMG Pi uh, repository, and then you're gonna go over to the pull request tab. So um, those of you who are familiar with developing already, you've probably spent a lot of time in this tab. And those of you who are uh, just joining us, you're going to become very familiar with it. Um, but basically what's in this list is different people have suggested changes to RMG Pi. Everyone who has contributed before can see all the changes they've made. We can make comments on them. We can approve it. We can request changes. Um, and eventually we can merge it into RMG Pi, which will add you to the list of contributors. So we'll break down one that I've been working on lately, just to kind of get an idea of the anatomy of what a pull request looks like. It's too complicated of an example. Let's look at how I opened a really good example, actually, just from this training session. Um, so you can see here how I uh, opens the pull request. And again, there's a template that we'd like you to fill out. Um, it includes things like, why are you opening this pull request? Um, what changes have you made? There's another section that's not here um, that includes things like suggestions for people to try when they're reviewing your pull request so that they can get through it as quickly as possible and um, hopefully with as much accuracy as possible. Uh, whenever you run the pull request, this bot is gonna show up and leave a comment. Uh, and tell you if the test coverage increased or decreased. The test coverage is how many lines of the code base are currently tested using our uh, unit testing setup. Uh, the goal eventually will be to get this to 100%. Currently, we are sitting at a solid 48%, so halfway there, we'll say. Um, but the Probably most critical thing about making a pull request is the testing. So you can see here that Howey has her own branch named Update Notebooks. And inside this pull request, if we go over to the Files Change tab, Howey updated one of the source code files in uh, the Git repository and then added three demo notebooks, which we ran the other day. Uh, the idea being that now when we distribute it, it will automatically include those. If we go down to the bottom of the pull request, we see the status tab. And the one that you really wanna pay attention to is this one that's called constant integration. So what this is doing is whenever someone suggests changes to RMG, this is going to go grab a copy of all of the code that they have on their branch, including all of their changes. It's going to build RMG and clone RMG database and set everything up, including uh, RMS and all the Julia stuff. And then it's going to subject it to our unit tests. So this takes about two and a half hours to run. Uh, for those of you just starting to develop, I know that sounds like a long time, uh, but about a month ago, it was like six hours. So we've been making good progress. Hopefully, we'll continue to do so. Um, one of the important things that you'll look at 
uh, if this were to fail. So, for example, um, if a unit tests, functional tests, or database tests fail, you'll get a big red X here, and it will tell you explicitly which tests failed, so you can go in and try to fix it. Another important section is the regression tests. So let me find a PR that's completed this already. I should just go back to this. So here's a PR that we merged uh, just the other day. So um, this is another good example. Um, Richard went in and fixed a problem we've had. We were getting these warnings um, from uh, an internal uh, section of uh, RMG. So all he did was change a few lines of code, which you can see in this files change tab. He changed all these CP depth to C depth. If you're curious what that is, I encourage you to read through this PR in the future. Um, you can see that when he uh, pushed off his changes, we ran the build and test Linux. And inside this, uh, test apparatus, we had the regression test execution. What this goes through and does is actually runs five different RMG jobs, uh, including minimal, which I know we've, or excuse me, super minimal, which I know we've executed at some point in the past couple of days. Um, and these are exactly the kind of things that um, we've been editing uh, and uh, teaching you how to write over the course of the workshop. Uh, and then the next important step is the comparing these results to the baseline. So every time someone tries to suggest changes to RMG, we want to make sure that we don't accidentally lose any functionality or that the results um, significantly change. Uh, if that were to happen, you know, maybe in a month, that would mean that RMG wasn't able to do what it could do before, or someone could go back and they would not be able to reproduce the same results that they had. Um, which would be not a great thing for the, the longevity of the tool if it can be trusted like that. So you can see here that Richard's example uh, passed all the different regression testing steps. Uh, it gives you this very nice output that says all the observables varied less than 0.5 uh, between the old and new models, so that counts as a pass. In the case that that fails, again, you'll get a giant red X and all of the output will be in that details tab. So you can go in and see where things went wrong uh, and try to fix it in the future. Um, you can also run these tests um, locally on your own computer, um, but I would recommend just push them to GitHub and let them do it. The tests take a very long time. Like I said, about two and a half hours because there are a lot of them and it's a pretty complex piece of software. Um, but it's much quicker to run them yourself. Yes, yeah, so you will cut off. So I, like, I, I will often run a, just make test on my thing because I've already got it compiled. I don't need to do all of the two hours. Like one of the two hours is downloading and compiling and building, which I've already done. Yeah. So I will often run local tests as well as the GitHub. Yeah, so um, at least starting the GitHub at the same time as you start to run your test can be um, fruitful. Um, we don't have to like pay for these runners. This is all in Microsoft. So. Think of like every time Microsoft has wasted your time by like losing your emails or like making your images jump like way down Word docs. Like this is just revenge. <laughs> We're using their hardware for our testing. And in the future, um, hopefully like later this afternoon, um, this is gonna be run on both Linux and Mac OS, which will uh, hopefully prevent us from continually adding uh, bugs be nice uh, and in that case you definitely won't be able to run both of those simultaneously unless you were like typing a few computers at the same time um, so definitely you know this is the last step that you need in order to get something into rmg um, so make sure that uh, we're prioritizing uh, getting that to getting that in um so i guess the I'll, pa I'll pause briefly here for questions on git or github or the pull request or issues, anything like that. Um, yeah. You're trying, <clears throat> you're trying to like improve the accuracy of something and your results change and it fails the test, because, but it's like a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's yeah. funny you mentioned that. Um, we actually have a pull request open right now that is, I want to say like six years old. And this is a 
exception to the rule. Usually we're pretty good at these. Yeah, so Alone added a symmetric top rotor. So this was like an additional correction to the uh, hindered rotors that is more accurate than the previous ones. And if we go down to his unit tests, you can actually see that they failed. So if we look at what actually happened, and again, this is one of the nice things about the GitHub Actions is it will show you precisely which lines caused the problem and the exact numbers. Sometimes you have to scroll a little bit, but um, yeah, so you can see here that in this test, which was the rotational constant or symmetric top rotor, uh, we expected the result to be 4.9 and instead of 5.3. That doesn't mean that his changes are wrong. His yep. changes might be better. Yep. And this is the part where we would then ask for reviewers or you would ask for commentary. There's this section over here, the reviewers. So um, when we get to a step like that, we would ask someone with a lot more experience than I have to go in and check if this is a good improvement and if we should merge it, or if the tests just need to be fixed, or if there is something wrong with the code. Oh, yeah, that's one of the nice things about this that everyone can see. So maybe someone who knows a lot about it can step up and, and fix that. Great question. Other questions on this? Testing the database contributions. So the, this code contribution like it, you've added a feature or whatever, it's kind of obvious the yeah. consequences. But the, the way, can you talk a little bit about what tests are run on the database and how you contribute data. Because we, yeah. we talked on like Monday about how to add data to a database. That's right, yeah. Um, so but the testing methods. Yeah, so the way that we are currently verifying um, changes in the RMG database is essentially assuming that any new change put into the database is a good change. Hopefully we're not adding worse data than we already have. And every night, the open file. We'll really go behind the scenes. We'll look at the actual constant integration or continuous integration um, flow. Um, every night on a schedule, we will run the constant integration even if no one has merged any changes. So what this does is, let's say it's uh, Thursday morning and at some point on Wednesday, Kevin uh, pushed a thousand new CCSD uh, values into RMG database because he's a CompChem wizard. Uh, now Thursday morning, we're going to go out and grab all those values. We're going to rerun all the testing. And the results of that is now going to be treated as the quote unquote baseline ground truth best possible answer. Um, in terms of continually testing on RMG database, we're still using the old testing apparatus just while we iron out the last couple of wrinkles in this one. But I think as soon as we have the Mac testing in, we're probably going to try to migrate that to RMG database as well. Because sometimes the, the issue is that adding data to one place has unexpected consequences and the regression test of everything else changed can make a huge difference. Like you, you add a rate that's definitely better, but because of the way RMG averages from similar reactions and stuff, it makes something else unintentionally worse. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because it was missing data and it was used to average, to, it was used to estimate some neighboring thing, which you haven't done. Yeah, I think that's one issue in the part of the network. It's pretty very wrong. I think the regression has been to just check if something has changed. So there's a couple of like baseline mechanisms that have generated their rates before and after. So, like, we decided to add it something that's substantially better. And now, like, your rate estimates look better, but it's substantially different. The regression can also be like, sorry, it's failed. And it's, I think, kind of a thing to go and figure out something. Well, I think it's crucial that we go, it, it says this is changed, and then the reviewer has to go, yes, it changed for the better, or no, that was an intentional side effect. Um, not necessarily a bug, but a side effect. Yeah. Um, and then it needs a human to say, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm at least aware of what's happened and understand why it changed. Yeah, it's kind of hard to prove that the change in the regression is inherent much better or worse sometimes. There are cases like this. Like, I guess when you add data, for it could be better for the cases that's relevant. Um, but sometimes when you, I don't know, like when you repeat a tree, you can hit some strange nodes and stuff that you could. So the long and short of it is we've automated as much of this as we can, and we deliver the results directly to people making the PRs. And then it's up to human discretion to kind of interpret them in a lot of cases. Um, so again, that's 
we we've done as much as we can to make it simple, uh, and it's it goes directly to to you guys now. Um, so with that being said, I will now walk through. Maybe a, I'll call it a suggested development procedure. Um, there are tons and tons of different ways to develop RMG. Um, this is not the like singular way to do it. This is just the way that a lot of developers have um, decided to. Um, this Docker container that we've been using is a reasonable way to develop. Um, it's probably not the most efficient and not the most flexible. So what we suggest, and if you go to the RMG documentation, you will find this uh, just underneath the recommended installation instructions is the developer install. So this is uh, section 3.1.1. And this has the comprehensive zero to hero, how to develop RMG uh, on your own local machine. Um, a big caveat for this is that the Docker container that we send you is a image of a Linux system, specifically Debian. Our developer instructions are intended for people using Linux or Mac systems, basically just something Unix based. Historically, we have used RMG on Windows using a source installation. We have not tried in a very long time because it is prohibitively difficult. If you are on a Windows machine, I would recommend either trying to develop in the Docker or the better option is probably dual boot with Debian Linux or if you're feeling very brave, a virtual machine. But I do think I'm dual booting a machine right now. So this computer has both a Windows installation and a Debian Linux installation. That's probably your best option for actually doing the development. You can use other USB as code. Right. You can also use VS Code to like get in Docker and have. Your yeah, so that's the nice thing about the Docker image is if you do decide to develop in it, um, VS Code has a Docker extension. So um, it'll show up like this off to the side when you do install it. But if you go to the extensions marketplace on VS Code and just search Docker, it'll be the first thing that pops up. And what that allows you to do is connect to the Docker container from VS Code as if it were installed locally. Um, so you can edit the files using a really nice GUI, save your changes. Uh, as far as actually making um, commits on GitHub, um, that's going to involve a lot more um, reading on your part. If you're unfamiliar with Git, I can't give a super comprehensive Git tutorial, but we do have some online for how to get yourself started. Uh, I will say for Git, uh, RMG is definitely not something you can Google and find really good answers on for Stack Overflow, but Git is all over the place. So if you do run into weird Git problems, or if someone on the pull requests tells you like, hey, can you rebase this branch from main commit, blah, 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 you can basically just copy paste whatever they told you to do into Google, and it will tell you how to do it on Stack Overflow or you know, ChatGPT could probably do it now too. Yeah, so that, that, that's a compelling option. And I, we should add to um, Visual Studio Code is just one integrated development environment. Um, if you would like to develop in something else, uh, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, a lot of RMG developers just tend to use VS Code. It's open source. It's very extensible. It's pretty lightweight as well. And it runs on Mac and Linux, which is nice. Um, I think some other common ones that you might have uh, you might find online are things like PyCharm, and is that the there's like a paid one as well. I think it is PyCharm. Yeah, PyCharm is another really popular one. Um, but again, a lot of us a lot of us use VS Code. So just quickly walking through the source installation. Um, not actually going to repeat this because as Richard alluded to, this takes uh, probably about thirty minutes to do. Um, from start to finish. So uh, not a lot of fun sitting here watching things compile, but you could if you really want. Uh, the very first step is to use the uh, Anaconda Environment Manager. So this is basically a way to create uh, virtual environments inside your uh, computer. So each of these is just pointing to a directory somewhere on your computer that's going to hold all the packages that you download. 
Uh, this dramatically simplifies the process of uh, keeping things separated, getting the right versions of everything that you need. Second step is a handful of operating system level requirements. So uh, Git is the version management we've been talking about. GCC and G++ are two compilers. Uh, and then make is a program that just executes what's called a make file, which is a nice set of instructions for uh, giving shortcuts to common tasks. So earlier Richard said um, he likes to run make test. Make test is a um, shortcut that we've written that will automatically execute the unit tests on your own machine if you have uh, your installation already, already set up and working. This last step might not be here in like a day or so. So if you do do the RMG install uh, today, do this. Um, if you wait like a week, like refresh this page and it might not be there. We, we might have finally fixed this. Um, this is a limitation that an older version of Julia used to have that we've since hopefully dealt with. The next couple steps are downloading the actual source code from RMG Pi and RMG database. Then you create this environment using Conda, and this is what goes and downloads all the load packages. And then the remaining few steps are compiling RMG Pi using make, uh, modifying your environment variables. And this is the step that makes this prohibitively difficult to do on uh, Linux and, or excuse me, on Windows. Uh, and then the last step is uh, Julia installations. So um, as you've heard mentioned as well, uh, the back end of RMG reactor simulations are done in Julia. Uh, Julia is just another um, high-level programming language like Python. Um, most of RMG is in Python. Just some of the reactors so far have been moved to Julia. Um, the way things are going, we're hopefully going to move all of the reactor simulations into Julia. Right now, there's only a couple that are missing, uh, but we would like to move all of those over since it's quite a bit faster. Um, and the actual implementations are much simpler than the Python ones. Uh, but the rest of it, is going to remain in Python just because it's a lot easier to work with uh, for the kind of work that we do uh, and more, much more extensible uh, readily than, than the Julia side of things. Um, yes, like I said, well, we, we won't go through this right now um, just for the, the time's sake, but uh, any, I'll stop here for questions um, from the Zoom as well on the installation procedure or any of the software I've mentioned so far, anything like that. Cool. Um, so I'm going to spend this last 30 minutes ranting about <laughs> things that we should have on our. One question. Oh, there's a question. Oh, I can't see it. Can you? Yeah. So, what about the new RMG Pi version with Kami and GitHub? That is one which is being used to be a doctor. Got it. Yeah. Thank you for the question. That's a good clarification. Um, so, to give you a little bit of behind the scenes, we just moved to Docker in the past few weeks. Um, historically, we did have a lot of challenges trying to walk everyone through this really long installation procedure. So, Docker was sort of our solution for making it much easier to use RMG without having to do all of this. And it allowed us to run on Windows. So Windows users, you had a pretty good time, hopefully, just downloading Docker and then running the pull and run commands. Um, that would have not have been as easy in the past. Um, the current release as shown on GitHub, so I can go look at that now. Um, the current release as shown on GitHub says 3.1.0. We also see that's um, over two years old at this point. Um, we are in the process right now of releasing 3.2.0, at which point we will update this release tab on GitHub. This 3.1.1 was essentially just a, a small patch release for this workshop in particular. Um, we are Updating our internal mechanisms 
for doing the release schedule since Docker kind of shifted how we anticipate most people use it. Um, so maybe check back in a few weeks after we finally nailed that down. Um, but the Docker version 3.1.1 as described in the recommended installation instructions is the most up-to-date. So this is the one that we would like everyone to use. This contains all the latest changes. And as this version is incremented, we will keep it up to date in the uh, documentation here, as well as add maybe some more helpful instructions for how to uh, include that one or download that into your local environment. But yeah, thank you for the, for the question. Awesome. Okay. So seeing no other questions, we'll proceed to the ranting portion. So uh, RMG has a lot of features and is very, very powerful, uh, but is carrying around a bit of technical debt. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar with um, that software engineering term, technical debt just refers to code that was written by someone who has since uh, graduated or uh, has switched projects or something like that. So we no longer have someone on hand who's an, an expert in that code. Uh, so RMG has um, some things that we'd really like to fix. Um, one of them in particular is the memory usage. Um, the way that RMG is parallelized right now requires us copying the entirety of RMG database into every process. This is partially a limitation of Python. Um, Python behind the scenes uses what's called a global interpreter lock, which basically just means we cannot spread one Python uh, execution across multiple threads. We have to start multiple processes. And each of those processes has its own unique set of data and they can't talk to one another very easily. Um, that was originally programmed in that way. There have been substantial improvements, uh, but that would be quite a dramatic change to RMG. Um, if anyone is interested um, in trying to chip away at that with me, give me give me a shout on email or something because that will be uh, quite a fun series of changes um, and hopefully resolve a lot of our uh, memory issues. Uh, and then one other probably more substantial change that we'd like to look at is uh, the use of global variables. So. Um, need Google those in the RMG file. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Python, uh, there's the notion of what's called the global namespace. So the global namespace is data which is accessible to uh, every single function inside of a file, even if the variable is not from that file. Now that is innocent enough sounding, but when you actually go to implement it, it can become quite a uh, bottleneck for throughput. So let me go to Arcane, put this in there. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, this is an example of our use of global variables in RMG. So you can see here that uh, we have this function called species, which, as you can tell, loads a species from an input file. It calls this command global species dict job list and then proceeds to modify species dict and job list. And then all the way at the end returns neither of those two things. Um, this is a very difficult piece of code to debug because it's not at all obvious when you go through the execution how this, excuse me, how these variables change over time because you cannot actually track through. Uh, it has additional consequences in terms of speed because when you modify the global namespace instead of the local namespace, uh, the actual addresses in memory that you go to have to be more rigorously protected, uh, which costs a lot of execution time. So ideally, we would like to get rid of these. The actual 
implementation of that is going to involve changing our input file format, uh, which is going to be a substantial um, API change. Uh, something that experienced users have run into and new users are inevitably going to run into is things like spacing errors in your input files or weird Python formatting complaints or miscellaneous things that are very difficult to, to debug for no obvious reason. A lot of that is a consequence of uh, this design choice. Um, so that's something that we would like to um, tear out and replace. And then maybe one final um, big improvement we'd like to make is this isomorphism check. So uh, this appears in many, many places throughout RMG, both in checking if individual molecules are isomorphic to one another, as well as checking if uh, reactions are isomorphic with one another. Um, every time you go to generate a possible reaction or identify possible products, uh, this is going to be called multiple times. Um, and it is a very expensive operation to check if a graph is isomorphic. Um, I invite you to, to read online about uh, the, go to the Wikipedia page for isomorphism. Um, this ties into to graph theory and is a pretty mathematically uh, complex system, but um, the way that you can think about this is it's very difficult to calculate with an exact pathway uh, to the solution of the question, is, are these two graphs isomorphic? But it is very easy to check if your answer is correct. That's what's referred to in computer science as like an NP hard problem. Uh, basically just the, the, the consequences of that are that this is a very expensive operation to do and we have to do it a lot. So this is the kind of thing we would like to try to optimize more in the future or hopefully uh, reduce the number of times we have to call it in the first place. So th th that's sort of the internals uh, technical wish list, I'll call it. Um, that's the kind of thing we're looking for some uh, hardcore development help on. Uh, before I move on to more of like a feature wish list and some new functionality that we'd like to see added, um, again, I can pause for questions here. Um, one high level thing I probably should have started with is the actual layout of the RMG repository. Um, so it's relatively self explanatory, I hope. Um, most of the code is segmented into the folder uh, for the part of RMG that it belongs to. So the Arcane folder holds all the code for Arcane, the documentation holds the documentation for, for both. Um, examples is where we've been working out of a lot in this workshop. So it includes those input files we've been running. Uh, external is some of the external software that we use. Um, IPython includes the Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, RMG Pi is the rest of the RMG source code. Uh, we used some scripts on the first and second day for things like adding to the database. Uh, and then currently the test folder is segmented into two things, but uh, these are going to be uh, rejoined uh, at some point in the near future uh, into one uh, larger, larger folder. But yes, uh, questions on development or sort of our internals wish list. Awesome. So in the last few minutes here, we'll go through sort of a feature wish list. And if you're looking for uh, something to really dig your teeth into, or you want to get your first contribution on RMG, I recommend either looking through the issues or looking through the pull requests uh, for people that are maybe stuck and need a little bit of help. Um, so you can see, for example, uh, Yen Ting and I have been working on refactoring the fragment interface for that automated automated fragment modeling uh, software. Uh, this is the kind of thing where uh, the goal is to make this a little bit more extensible in the future. Other good examples of like feature wish list would be RMG Electrochem. Uh, this is a very long-standing PR that has actually switched branches a few times now, but uh, Matt Johnson has been working very hard to add the ability to deal with electrochemistry inside of RMG. Um, things like uh, checking the isomorphism of lists with four plus species. 
Uh, this is a relatively simple PR that we just had not worked on before because all of the reaction families in RMG are mostly unimolecular and bimolecular, I would say. So the, the trimolecular is rare. Uh, so tetramolecular does occasionally come up, I would imagine, but again, is not, not super common. But um, this is the kind of thing, it's a nice additional feature to have uh, and always good to um, add that additional flexibility to RNG. And then if we look at the issue side of things, we can see um, uh, this is a really good list of things that we'd like to work on um, in terms of both the software and the uh, feature side. So uh, let's find a good one here. Yeah, so for example, uh, adding the CHON uh, reaction mechanism. So this person found an exact problem where we were unsuccessful. So it's a good option to uh, maybe try to add additional functionality in that regime or fix whatever we have that's not um, precisely working as we might expect. Uh, another issue on compatibility with uh, Chemkin into RMG, we currently support the opposite, but doing the inverse of that would be um, helpful as well. Yeah, if you are really seriously interested in developing, we have a uh, Slack, which we can add uh, developers to. And yeah, you've got uh, all of the emails now as well for the RMG developer list. Uh, that is a pretty good place to get in touch with someone if you have a question um, that we can't sort out on a GitHub issue or if you need help getting started on something and we'd be more than happy to um, help you out there. So with that being said, I think that's about everything you need to get started with RMG development. Uh, I will reiterate for the current developers that you can now do testing on forks. So you no longer have to make branches off of RMG Pi and then develop there. So please move back to forks uh, so that we can cut down on the number of branches. I'm more than happy to answer additional questions here. I guess we could also say thank you for coming to the RMG workshop. This is our very last session. Any advice for migrating from an RMG branch to a, a fork branch or do we just so I'd say if you already have branches okay. open that are off of RMG, so for example, I actually have a couple, I'm freaking my own suggestion, but this branch uh, predates being able to run on forks. So it's off of a branch on RMG Pi. If you're feeling brave, I'm sure that again, Stack Overflow or ChatGPT could tell you how to Presumably, it has something to do with making a fork and then just adding this branch to your fork, but it's probably more trouble than it's worth. I would say for the 58 pull requests we have open, I think almost all of them are still on branches on RMG Pi. Let's just try to finish those and just don't make any more on RMG Pi and start moving towards forks forks in the future. It's actually quite easy to switch to a fork branch. So first you click the bottom to fork and on a terminal, you can do git remote add and you add your fork one and then you, instead of pushing to the official one, you push to that. So you specify where, which one you push it to. And when you add the remote, you name it. So you can name it one, this one, name it official. And for your thing, name it my branch, my fork version. And you can just, it'll be git push my branch name and then the branch name that you're using. Okay. So it's very straightforward. What I'm not sure you can do is change where a we'll pull request. Yeah, I'm not sure. So I don't, I think you can easily make your own push. You can just push your 
branch to your fork, but you won't change when pull requests coming from. So these are the open pull requests. Just yeah, if it's already it have a PR. Um, but also, I mean, there are sometimes it's actually not a bad thing to be doing it on the official fork. Let it lets other people more other people are more likely to see your code. If you're going to be collaborating with people on a thing rather than it being on your fork, then you've got to give them permission to push your fork up. So um I think they, this whole doing it all in private on our own forks has some benefit. What's your reason for pushing us that way? Uh part of it is the testing, like you distribute the like continuous integrations. Well run is I guess. Yeah. Okay. So that that's that is one component of it. This is I mean, my we've primary got, yeah. concern. So, so we've got a lot of um, <laughs> yeah. This is an unprecedented amount of technical debt in my that I've seen. Um yeah. It is it is prohibitively difficult to it doesn't develop on a repository when it looks like this. Um, some of these are over seven years old, so like very clearly could have been deleted at the time, but just weren't because the requirement was that you fork or the, that you made a branch on the main repository rather than developing on a fork. So part of my motivation to switch towards fork is to prevent this from building up again. Um, as far as you know, when you're doing one of those collaborative development, uh, like much longer form PRs, um, I do think it pays still to maybe then have a single branch off of RMG, like a feature branch that you're adding to, but then continue to do small incremental PRs off of your port and out of that branch, rather than uh, into main um, each time. Um, and that's another thing I can, um, point out here is that when you make a pull request, you're not obligated to try to immediately push it into the main branch. It will default to that. And that's probably what you want to do a lot of the time. But let's say, for example, I was working on the BASF project and I had some changes that I wanted to make. I could open a pull request against BASF from my branch called BASF suggestions. And then we could get that merged into there and then BASF into main rather than just directly into main. And a lot of this is sort of stylistic choices. Um, it is uh, up to the individual developer. Um, but we do prefer when you do a pull request and it gets out of date to rebase rather than merge from main um, just to preserve the linearity of the, of the Git history. If anyone has suggestions for good starting points for people learning Python, um, I learned it too long ago to remember what I used, but if anyone has good suggestions, again, feel free to share them now or over email or anything like that. If anyone got started recently or remembers what they got started with. I think I used like MITx or there's a, another version. Open courseware. Yeah. Yeah. Which one? Real Python. That might be a bit outdated. So, so uh, the first results on Google are probably going to get you pretty far. So, Real Python, uh, MIT's Open Courseware, which might be called MITx now. Thank you all again for joining us, uh, particularly those of you who traveled. We appreciate you making it all the way up here. We're sorry that it's cold all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess it was kind of nice this week. So thank you for bringing good weather with you. We look forward to seeing you all in the PR tab.